Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where so it begins, the Logan deals. Yes, Logan was very hot out of the gate and as a result, Hugh Jackman has gotten what maybe is the first of many rewards. But even if it's his only reward, it's definitely uh, something I don't think he would have been able to get before. Not only Logan did so well at the box office, but so well with critics because he has got the attention of Michael Mann. And he, although Michael Mann is hit or miss, although I, I'm sure it also annoys Michael Mann that he was the inspiration for Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, his Heat film was, and that film was so successful while Heat was so not successful. But anyway, Michael Mann has been wanting to make a movie about Enzo Ferrari, um, the famous car maker, for quite some time. And it hasn't been able to work out. Christian Bale was the last, speaking of Batman, Christian Bale was the last person attached to that. Uh, and that didn't work out because uh, apparently he had, Christian Bale had to gain some weight for the role and health problems arose. And they're saying, I, I thought it was funny that in Deadline's coverage, they were like, Hugh Jackman can gain weight, no problem, you know, hilarious. You know, and, uh, they talked about the fact that he's had to stay in shape for 17 years to play um, Wolverine, and now he can uh, uh, gorge himself on pasta. And I, if I were Michael Mann or the producer of this Ferrari movie, I'd say, no, you cannot. <laughs> I still need Hugh Jackman to look like Hugh Jackman. Uh, I think his older Wolverine bod that he was sporting, uh, particularly toward the end of the movie when he was wearing a tank top in Logan, I think was close enough uh, to what they might need for Enzo Ferrari. So uh, Hugh Jackman will play Enzo Ferrari, and it's the story of not only the Ferrari empire that he built as a car maker, but also his relationship with his wife. And it's a, apparently a fiery Italian love affair. And Numi Rapace, who I think will play a fantastic fiery Italian, she's from The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, uh, will co-star. Uh, they look kind of alike, uh, Hugh Jackman and Numi Rapace, but this sounds pretty good to me. Uh, I think also what's interesting is that I think Hugh Jackman is pulling a Leonardo DiCaprio, and now his main goal is to win an Oscar. He's got the major franchise. He's got the big bucks. He has a place established in Hollywood lore already and with fans, and now I think he'd like an Oscar to go with it. And I don't blame him. He already came close when he was nominated for Best Actor for Les Mis. He lost to Daniel Day-Lewis for Lincoln. Anytime you lose to Daniel Day-Lewis, that's totally understandable. And, and something of an honor, although... I think the bigger honor, of course, is to get an Oscar. So I don't know if this will get him an Oscar, but I think it puts him on the board. And I think it's a very good shot that if he does a good job uh, in his performance, that he could perhaps be nominated, at least for a Golden Globe, right? Because they split it the, into drama and comedy or musical. So there's 10 uh, actors who are nominated instead of just the five for the Oscars. But I think it's great. Hugh Jackman worked really hard on Logan. He really wanted to not only change the way, you know, make sure people remembered the character uh, on a high note, uh, but also, I think, to change the course of his career in Hollywood. And it seems that he is successful in both. And it's so wonderful when someone can succeed in very ambitious goals. All right, so speaking of ambitious goals, uh, I'm sure that many people who are of Middle Eastern descent who want to have a, a, a career in Hollywood are told that that is quite the ambitious goal, if not impossible. But your opportunity has come. Uh, I, you know, the live action Aladdin movie is casting, and I was a big um, advocate of Riz Ahmed for the role. Uh, actually, one of you tweeted me yesterday and said, What about Riz Ahmed for Nightwing? And I was like, I'm such a big Riz Ahmed fan, I'd like him to do anything. But I think he could be Nightwing as well. He'd be a, a, a good choice. But anyway, I think he kind of has that look as well. But as for Aladdin, uh, Disney, Disney's live action movie, uh, directed by Guy Ritchie, clearly wants to go younger as they've put out an open casting call for the roles of Aladdin and Jasmine, and they're looking for someone 18 to 25. This is incredible news. Just because you're going to want to know, down below in the video description, I have put the information on how to submit yourself for um, the casting. You know, so if you are, they said they in the casting notice, they say very clearly these characters are Middle Eastern. So if you are of Middle Eastern descent between the years of 18 and 25, and you can sing, you must be able to sing, and you have some dancing ability, that would be a plus, uh, go for it. Because it's amazing that Disney would cast two unknowns in uh, such a high profile movie. They'll probably get a known name for the, the, the genie. Uh, and also maybe somebody for Jafar, right? Uh, and uh, I think that that would 
probably worked very well in making sure this had some star power. You know who I would get for Jafar? Uh, Irfan Khan. Uh, he's a fantastic actor. He had a small role in the life of Pi. Uh, he was also, you know, the um, the head of, of the of the corporation that bought out John Hammond in Jurassic World. And I'll never forget at the press screening there was a round of applause when he came on screen. He's a great guy, very successful in Bollywood, which is a huge market. Just ask the Jungle Book and all the money they made in India. Uh, and, you know, also somebody that American audience is known to American audiences as well. So uh, I think so. Again, the genie and Jafar uh, and maybe even the Sultan, great uh, opportunities to cast name actors. But they're actually going to do it and go for two unknowns for Aladdin and Jasmine. Also, this makes it clear that this is going to be a musical and a Guy Ritchie musical Seems like a really weird choice to me, you know, as a director, uh, but here's hoping he can do it. I mean, the material seems almost uh, foolproof to me, <laughs> but never underestimate Guy Ritchie. He's made some good movies, but he's also made some truly horrible movies. Uh, let's see how King Arthur turns out. Also, what's interesting is that the rehearsals are starting April 2017, it notes here in the casting, and then also they'll be shooting from July 2017 to January 2018. That is an extremely long shoot. Maybe they're going to do some stuff on location, maybe they're going to have some you know green screen uh, you know on a sound stage uh, shooting but that's that's a, a tremendous amount of time but also I think that means it's probably gonna take the uh, untitled live-action uh, release date that Disney has uh, bookmarked that's August 2nd 2018 that's typically a wild card release date Guardians of the Galaxy the first one came out uh, that weekend Suicide Squad Guardians of the Galaxy, of course, graduating to opening the summer this year. Uh, but I think that, you know, you might think, is Aladdin really a wild card? Well, if it has two unknown actors of Middle Eastern descent, con considering what's going on politically in this country right now, um, and, you know, America still duking it out with China as the biggest box office market globally, uh, it is a little bit of a risk. So I think that August is actually a great date for it. Uh, I'm very excited. I hope they find two very personable, likable actors. Uh, and um, some two, two careers are launched. That would be just so exciting. And it's also worth noting that uh, that, say, and that means in 2018, Disney will have two live-action fairy tales coming out as Mulan is slated for November 2nd, 2018. We're going to talk about Mulan for the viewer question. Uh, I, I actually specifically chose that viewer question because it fits so well with this Aladdin casting story. But uh, I'm curious, what do you think of the idea of using unknowns? Do you think it's a good or a bad idea? I think it's so exciting. We'll probably get a lot of uh, good publicity for the picture as well. I'm sure that has not escaped Disney publicity or the producers of uh, this live action Aladdin either. Uh, and then also, again, to remind you, I have the information down below in the video description on how to submit if you, uh, if you would like to. And, and, and good luck. Break a leg if you decide to submit. Now, the third story of the day is about uh, Drew Goddard, my, one of my favorite screenwriters in a time when screenwriters don't get a lot of respect. But Drew Goddard just sold a screenplay to 20th Century Fox called uh, Bad Times at the El Royale. Uh, and it was uh, done very in a very clandestine manner because this is a thriller which has twists and turns. You know, of course, his directorial debut was Cabin in the Woods, which he also wrote. Very smart, clever film. Uh, it was a great calling card for him. Joss Whedon produced it, and that, of course, also helped the film get some attention. Uh, but I, I would imagine that, likewise, this is going to have some twists and turns in it, and they don't want to give it away. So I think in a, in not only to protect the secrets of the movie, but to kind of build buzz, what they did was they had couriers take tablets to the head of all the studios. You couldn't even just take it to the development department. Usually someone in development will read it first, check out and see if it's any good, and then they'll, you know, pass it up the up the, up the totem pole as the higher-ups take a look at it and see if they do indeed want to bid for it. But here it had to go directly to the studio heads. They had to read it off the tablet so that nobody could make a copy of it. And then as soon as they were done, they had to hand that tablet back to the courier. Ah, that's really awesome. So Fox said, we want this. So Fox has uh, won the rights. Uh, Drew Goddard, will this will be the second film that he'll direct. He wrote it, and he will also produce it. Uh, now, he's done some great stuff. He helped uh, shape Daredevil, but then he got into a fight with Isaac Perlmutter uh, because of some of the other opportunities he was taking and got kicked off of it, although he still gets credited, good for him, uh, with all Daredevil-related uh 
episodes. Uh, he also, of course, worked on World War Z. I think he did a great job fixing that movie. He wrote The Martian, which is an incredibly smart film, uh, and that was a hard thing to do because so much of The Martian was a single guy by himself, and Drew Goddard had to make that something that you could watch in a movie that's visual, you know, and you can't hear a person thinking. So I think that's really fantastic. Uh, also, of course, uh, he was drafted recently to work on Deadpool 2, which I think is very good, because, again, I think he's so talented. And he's also written Robopocalypse, which Steven Spielberg was supposed to make, but that's really not moving forward right now. And he also wrote Sinister Six for Sony uh, when, that, when they were going to do that after The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Who knows what the state of that project is at, um, at this point. But still, I'm so happy for Drew Goddard. He's very talented. I think he's a talented director as well as a writer. And so I'm glad that he's able to get back behind the director's chair and that, you know, he seems to maybe be finding a home at Fox. I believe The Martian was a Fox movie, and so I'm glad that they, they want to keep him happy and in-house. That's It's very good for any talent to develop a relationship with a studio. Uh, they really look out for you. You get to have, like, an office on the lot. It's pretty sweet. So good for him, and I, I let's keep an eye on this. No, no information about what it's about, except that it's a thriller with sci-fi horror elements or knowing Drew Goddard, maybe a little bit of both. So fantastic. Let's keep an eye out for that. And it's so nice to see a screenwriter not only doing well in Hollywood, but moving forward. All right, so the viewer question, as I said, has to do with Disney live actions, uh, live action Mulan. And this is from a uh, frequent BTT viewer and commentator, Anna Mavix. And Anna Mavix says, hi, Grace, question. With all the issues surrounding the Beauty and the Beast fiasco about uh, LeFou being gay, do you think it will hurt Disney and Sony's live action Mulan? Mm, uh, I, well, I, and, and Animavix said overhead. I'm not quite sure what Animavix means by that, but you know, I think this is, is going to put Mulan. And uh, luckily for both these properties, it happened before they started filming. So I think that considering all the problems with LeFou being just a member of the LGBT community, I think that Disney and Sony, you know, have to be careful how they decide to handle the Mulan situation. Is it because you know, for instance, ABC, which is owned by Disney, there once upon a time made Mulan. Uh, a lesbian character, uh, you know, and there's some question about if this is cross-dressing. They even made a joke about it in the animated movie. But the question is, why is Mulan doing this? Is she doing this because she wants to take her father's place and only men can serve? So she, you know, that's what she, that's logistically what has to happen. Uh, and it was something of a commentary on gender, you know, uh, from that, from a perspective of who can do what, don't underestimate women, right, in the animated movie. But then a lot of people have seen the stories that talk about, you know, Mulan want, you know, actually feeling that she's masculine to some degree, right? So I would think that for a family movie and for such a, a story, a classic story like Mulan, maybe I don't, if I were Disney or Sony, I, particularly if I were Disney after what happened with Beauty and the Beast, I wouldn't want to take that route with this property. I'm not saying movies like that can't and shouldn't be made, but uh, I don't think they should be made in something that's so integral to a studio's bottom line and is such a huge investment. And also, you know, the, the original Mulan fairy tale wasn't about that. You know, so if the if, like the Chinese uh, fable, if that was what it was about, well, then you have to you have to respect that and honor that. That's something that's being layered on. Mulan is being used to promote that social discussion, right? That 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 uh, the, that that. Uh, to try and make that it, I think Mulan's being co-opted. That's the correct word. Mulan's being co-opted for this cause, and because it's not that wasn't the idea when Mulan the story was first told. I wouldn't. I don't think it's a good idea. Let's come up with an original story to promote that cause uh, and have it be a separate entity. It can even be a big budget movie. Whatever you want to do, you know, uh, maybe make a gender ambiguous character, right? Uh, that could be something really interesting. But I think as far as Disney and Sony with this fairy tale Mulan movie, I would focus more on sacrifice for family and you know, uh, you know, showing that women are very good in are good in battle and, and uh, taking over responsibility for the family. I think that's a large part what Mulan, in my opinion, is about the original story. You know, coming from a time very much where men were responsible for taking care of a family. You know, all the burden fell on their shoulders and also the burden of war. And Mulan's kind of like. Well, just because you have a daughter doesn't mean that she, you know, especially in a, in a country, by the way, which is always really frowned upon daughters, and they, it was considered a disadvantage if you have a daughter instead of a son, to really show that daughters can be a resource and can lead and, and help the family as well. So that's what I would focus on with uh, these two Mulan movies. Uh, and also, not make them shot-by-shot -shot, uh, remakes. That's not what the Beauty and the Beast movie is. It's very similar, very close, though, and that seems to have hurt it as well. So I would make sure that the live-action Mulans are very different than the animated movie to 
also avoid that. Uh, I still think Beauty and the Beast hopefully is going to do quite well. It deserves to. It's a, I think it's a fabulous movie, uh, but it's certainly creating a little bit of a, a you know a roadmap for how Mulan should progress to avoid some of the same. Uh, pitfalls that Beauty and the Beast inadvertently stepped into. So that's my thoughts. I'd be very curious to hear what you think in terms of Mulan and what it, the story should be about and what it should represent and what, what causes it should um, go for. And do you believe, how do you feel about the transgender and, um, you know, the LGBT community co-opting the Mulan story? Do you think it's a good idea? Or are you against it? And especially considering what happened with Beauty and the Beast. And I want you to think about it not just from the perspective of a fan or uh, you know, in terms of like the, the social situation, but also from Disney's perspective as a company that has shareholders and fans who have who who love the animated movie. It's a property to them. I think you have to take that all into account to really decide. I think re realistically, what Disney should and should can realistically do. You know, I think a lot of times people will tell corporations to do this and that without really thinking about everything that the corporation has to. So therefore you know, it's hard to have a conversation because you're ignoring so much of what is really at stake for the company and really does need to be a part of that conversation because it is a part of the conversation. All right, right. I mean, Disney's not a charity. They can't give like $150 million to, to promote uh, a cause uh, that wasn't even a part of their original movie, right? I mean, it's, 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 um, it's tough. So write your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, write your thoughts down below in the top three stories. And a Mavics is a viewer question. Anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.